If you're taking thyroid medication and you're worried about your bones, this video is for you. There's a lot of confusion about thyroid hormone and how it affects bone. And recently, I was passed along a study that really helped to give me some clarity on this topic. So let's start with the concern I hear from my patients, which goes like this. I'm scared to take thyroid medication because I heard it can cause osteoporosis. Now that fear isn't totally unfounded. We know from lots of research that hyperthyroidism, especially when severe or prolonged, can increase bone turnover and does absolutely lead to bone loss. But that doesn't mean that treating hypothyroidism with thyroid hormone causes the same problem. Now, the study that I'm gonna talk about is from 2022, and it's actually out of the Journal of Thyroid Research. So this study looked at 79 women with hypothyroidism who were already on thyroid hormone therapy. The causes ranged from everything from autoimmune, thyroiditis, thyroidectomy, so a broad spectrum of patients with low thyroid. Now, the researchers divided them into five groups based on their TSH levels. So let's just take a minute to define TSH. So TSH is the thyroid stimulating hormone. So this is essentially your brain telling your thyroid to make more thyroid hormones. So the feedback loop goes from your periphery, from your body to your brain, your brain tells your thyroid to make more thyroid hormone. So TSH is the typical biomarker used in the conventional medical system to evaluate thyroid function. We'll talk about why that's maybe not the best or the only biomarker that you should use for thyroid evaluation and function, but this is what the study used in their protocols. So they divided these participants into five groups. A TSH of greater than four, so this is the conventional diagnosis criteria for low thyroid, hypothyroidism. A TSH of greater than four, which is technically not low thyroid, but still hypothyroid according to the conventional medical system. TSH of one to four, which is quote unquote optimal. I like it more like one to two, a little tighter range. And then the third group was TSH of 0 0.2 to one. And then the fourth group is 0 0.01 to 0 0.2, and then those with a truly suppressed TSH, which is less than 0 0.01. So this is a quote unquote, fully suppressed TSH. So then they measured the bone turnover markers. Now they measured four different bone turnover markers, but guess which two stood out? P1 and P and CTX. So you've probably heard me talk about these before, but P1 and P is the bone building biomarker. So this is your osteoblasts laying down bone. And when they do that, they secrete P1 and P, which you can measure in blood. The CTX is the breakdown marker. So this is C telepeptide, and it is the breakdown marker looking at osteoclast function. So the cells that are breaking down bone. So if you have P1 and P and CTX, you can actually measure bone metabolism by looking at a ratio between the two. Now they did also measure two other bone biomarkers. So these are bone specific ALKFOS and osteocalcin. They did not see an association of those two biomarkers with either low bone density or TSH. Not to say that they're useless, they just didn't actually have a correlation in this particular study. I don't use them in our practice anymore. Osteocalcin's uh, an interesting biomarker, but bone specific ALKFOS, I have not found to be very reliable in our clinical practice. Okay, so what did the study show? Well, it showed an inverse relationship and a very strong one at that of P1 and P and TSH. So what does that mean? So essentially what happened is, is as TSH dropped, P1 and P went up. And this is really important because P1 and P again is the bone building biomarker. So if P1 and P is gonna go up as TSH drops, you might say, ooh, I actually like that. This is something that I want. But CTX, which followed a similar pattern with TSH, also went up. So CTX went up, P1 and P went up, although P1 and P did rise more than did CTX. So technically, it looks like you would have improved bone turnover with a very suppressed TSH, except that that's not what we see in the bone mineral density data. So here's what we see with the bone density. The twist is that even though P1 and P went up, CTX went up, but not as much. What they showed is that when we looked at the bone mineral density data, those with a highly suppressed TSH actually lost bone. And this is a little counterintuitive because really you would think that again, improve bone turnover markers, you should improve bone density. But there's always more to it than just these things. This is why in a bone health space, we have to talk about all the things. So it looks like this suppressed TSH is gonna to lead to an increase in bone turnover and possibly imbalanced remodeling that would favor loss of bone over time. But my question is, is it due to the suppression of the TSH or is it due to something adjacent to it? 
I'll come back to that. So the conclusion of the study was essentially that if you keep the TSH within range, if you're in the safe zone, then you're probably not going to have any issues with thyroid replacement for people with low thyroid. However, now this is hugely important because so many people with low thyroid symptoms are concerned about taking a medication, whether it be levothyroxine, a desiccated thyroid product or whatever, they're afraid to take it because they have seen this association online and groups, whatever, about thyroid medication and osteoporosis and bone loss. So this study helps to show that an adequately treated low thyroid patient with a TSH within the range of 0.2 to 4.0 is going to not lose bone. This is not going to limit the ability of them to improve their bone health. Now, this study also pointed out a couple of really interesting things. So one of them is those that still had hypothyroidism, technically with a TSH of greater than four, actually had slowed down bone turnover markers. This is important, and this is one of the reasons why we need to treat low thyroid function, because both P1 and P and CTX slow down. This makes sense because in hypothyroidism, everything slows down. For those of you struggling with these symptoms, which I'll talk about in a second, you know this to be true. Now, at first glance, when you look at those bone turnover markers in that condition, it looks like, hey, maybe this is actually supportive of bone growth. But the problem is, just like if you look at bone turnover markers in a patient on a, an anti-resorptive drug, a bisphosphonate or a prolia, they also have suppressed and a ratio that looks pretty good bone turnover markers. But the problem is, is when the levels are so low that you can't support adequate bone metabolism, it doesn't really matter what the ratio is. There's just not enough bone metabolism. So let me just run through some of the symptoms of low thyroid function. So if you're asking yourself the question of, hey, do I have this thing? Let me just run through this list. And it's kind of long, but it starts most commonly what people will complain about with brain fog or what they might call like slowed thinking. Sometimes people will talk about mood disorders like depression, anxiety, emotional instability. Low thyroid function can also lead to peripheral neuropathy. So that means numbness, potentially even pain. Low thyroid function can lead to a slow heart rate called bradycardia can lead actually to b increased blood pressure. So hypertension because of the changes in the, the vascular walls, the muscle walls of the arteries. It can lead to abnormal cholesterol levels. So elevated LDL, total cholesterol. There is an association with heart attack and low thyroid function. We see issues with weight gain or resistant weight loss. We see cold intolerance, people that are walking around in the summer wearing a down jacket. Right? For women who are still cycling, we see menstrual irregularities and actually infertility. From a musculoskeletal perspective, you can actually see things like muscle weakness, cramps, stiffness, joint pain. Some people might even confuse this with the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And from a bone health perspective, of course, we have poor bone remodeling. So hypothyroidism untreated will lead to slow bone metabolism. And for those that are losing bone, this is going to get in the way of them actually rebuilding their bone. This is one of the reasons why we are so interested and proactive about treating low thyroid function. Now the list goes on and on, but I'll just say one more because this one I, I think also often gets overlooked, which is constipation or slow GI motility. Remember that humans, no matter what your diet, should probably be having at least one bowel movement a day. And if you're not, we probably need to figure out why. Now, the good news about this study is that they didn't just measure TSH. As I mentioned, I don't think that TSH should be used alone to evaluate the thyroid. This study actually helps to support that. But before I get to what these other lab values are, if you are on your bone health journey, you are looking to improve your bone metabolism, reverse osteoporosis, or just prevent osteoporosis. If you haven't been to our bone health masterclass, our Osteo Collective masterclass, please come see the top five mistakes that we see people making as they are going through their bone health journey. The internet is full of information and not all of it's great, as you probably know. So we have seen over the thousands and thousands of people that we've talked to going through this journey, we've seen the same mistakes over and over again. So I'm happy to share those top five mistakes with you. And this should help to time collapse your journey to improving your bone health. So look for the link in the description on YouTube, or you can come check us out at osteocollective.com. Okay, so what are these other labs? Well, a full thyroid panel is going to include TSH, but it's also going to include free and total T3 and T4. It's gonna include some other things too, but let's just stop there. So T3 and T4 are two of the thyroid hormones. In fact, your thyroid makes more than that. But T4 is considered the storage form of the hormone. T3 is considered the active form of the hormone. So 
in my practice and in all of my colleagues who are in the thyroid space, we all like to know what's happening with these hormones. I like to look at free T3, free T4, total T3, total T4. I want to look at these numbers because it's going to help me to understand beyond TSH what's happening at the cellular level. So many times we see people who have a quote unquote normal TSH who have a very low free T3. A lot of times, even people that are treated with levothyroxine, which is T4, they still have a very low free T3 because they have issues converting from T4 to T3. This is a genetically driven thing. So a lot of people who are not feeling better on levothyroxine might do better with a different form of treatment. Now, what's interesting here is that in this study, of course, we were looking at P1 and PCTX and TSH. But actually, if you look at free T3 in P1 and P, that association gets even stronger. So this is really compelling that as P1 and P went up, so did free T3. So more thyroid function at the cellular level, stronger association with bone function at the cellular level. So what that means clinically is that free T3 actually had a stronger association, is more clinically relevant than is TSH. So let's go back to then these highly suppressed individuals, the individuals with a TSH of less than 0.01. Because what the study is saying is that individuals that are in this group are losing bone. And they did show that on average, that's true. What they did say is that there is high inter-individual variability. So that means that in this group, there were some people that lost bone, but there were some people that, that did not lose bone, that actually showed an increase in bone marrow density. So what do we make of that? Well, I don't think the population was big enough to really draw a lot of conclusions here. I think that when we see people who are highly suppressed and other things aren't optimized, I think we do see bone loss. And this is where people get really concerned because lots of doctors and some of them that I have interviewed in the thyroid space. So Dr. Amy Horniman, the sex docs out of Scottsdale. So these providers are optimizing all hormones and oftentimes are treating thyroid dysfunction and suppressing TSH into what would be considered a highly suppressed state. Now they're basing this treatment off of symptoms and experience. So I'm not saying that they're wrong by any means. What's interesting though, is in these interviews, we talk about their experience with their patients and with bone health. And what they see is that their patients are not losing bone. So how is that possible? Well, I think what's happening here is that many people who are leaning very hard on the thyroid lever, highly suppressing their TSH might be missing something else that's wrong and they're just using thyroid to cover over it. In these practices with Dr. Horniman and others, they're taking a comprehensive and global approach. So they're optimizing not just thyroid, but they're optimizing all of the hormones. So it's not surprising to me then that if you have a more optimized picture altogether, that your body's gonna tolerate having a highly suppressed TSH much better. What I think we're seeing in this study is these are patients who are not on HRT. These are patients who are not being evaluated for anything else. So why are they leaning so hard on that thyroid lever to get their TSH under 0.01? My guess is we're probably missing something and we're just covering it up. So those other things might be causing this bone loss, not the TSH suppression alone. We can't really say that for sure, again, because the study is just not quite big enough, but it's an interesting argument either way, because I don't think that if sex hormones are optimized and TSH is highly suppressed, I don't think that we're going to see bone loss based off of the conversations that I've had with my colleagues and what we've seen in our practice. Okay, so what are my clinical takeaways here? Well, clearly you can safely treat hypothyroidism. And if you want to be careful, just keep your TSH in the normal range. This is simple. This is what we do for the vast majority of our patients. Very few of our patients actually in the highly suppressed range. Now, if you're new to thyroid management or if you personally are having your thyroid treated, you may want to avoid this oversuppression of the TSH if you're losing bone. And if you do need to oversuppress TSH, then you may want to ask the question of what else might potentially be going on. I would strongly encourage anybody who is utilizing thyroid medication to do bone turnover markers to make sure that they're not losing bone in between imaging studies. I would also strongly encourage measuring more than just TSH. We need a comprehensive thyroid panel, not just a TSH to understand what's happening at the cellular level. Okay, I think that wraps this one up. Remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.